I'm Anthony Cave, an anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And not too many years ago, I had a patient in the operating room who, like any other patient, was rushed in, had not even seen their surgeon before coming into the operating room. They went down on the table here, and the moment they got the mask over their face, the surgical mask or that operating room mask like this, I saw a single tear roll down their cheeks. This wasn't someone who was overtly sobbing or crying or projecting their frustration or anger on myself or anyone else. They weren't being rude or, or anything belligerent, but there was an internal pain. Now, unfortunately, I had already started pushing the propofol, which is what puts a patient under anesthesia. So I tried to stop pushing and I put my hand on her shoulder. I brought my head down closer to her ear and I asked, hey, what's up? And I was hoping I would get you know, a deep response. Like, you know, well, why are you crying? Clearly there's a lot of anguish and this is a scary environment. You're almost naked in a gown. It's cold. You're stressed and pain before surgery and the patient was already asleep. So I had to spend the next two hours wondering what was in my patient's mind as they were under anesthesia because how you fall asleep impacts what your surgery is like, your mental state, at least to an extent we believe in how you wake up and how you're gonna recover maybe for weeks to come. Well, unfortunately, when she woke up, she had no recollection of crying before falling asleep. So I was really out of luck there, but I tried to piece together what had happened to lead her into the operating room, the series of events that put her in a position where I felt that she was unheard, certainly unvalued, felt like a cog in the wheel or a button click. Maybe insurance had made her life miserable, just like it makes for doctors. Maybe she felt like she had no autonomy in her decision to have surgery. Well, I called her the next day and I got some more answers to what I was trying to figure out. And I'm gonna share them with you. And more importantly, I wanna share with you how has medicine gone from being a healing art of compassion and empathy to leading people to feel like they are sheeple or non-playable characters in a video game. And just to be clear, non-playable characters are like the people that you see in role-playing games on the computer that aren't controlled by a human. It's like they have no emotions no feelings, nobody cares about them. They're just wandering around in a make-believe world. Maybe they're lonely, maybe they're depressed or addicted or anxious, and no one seems to care about them. Well, too many of my patients feel this way. Too many patients have fallen asleep on the OR table quietly crying. And to think that this is okay and that it's just a part of the job totally misses the point. So I wanna share with you what I did not learn in medical school at Stanford, which I'm grateful to Stanford, don't get me wrong, but this wasn't taught there, it wasn't taught at Harvard in my residency or anywhere else in between. And it only came from years and years of watching patients quietly suffering and from what you all on social media and YouTube have shared in your comments. So first off, thank you to you all for being vulnerable and let me tell you what they never taught me. And before I tell you the story of how medicine came to be this way and how you can advocate for yourself to hopefully never have to be in the position that my patient was in that day on the operating room table. I'll share those tips at the end. Uh, I would of course appreciate if you hit that like button and share with others. I'm live here in a real life operating room after a long day in surgery and I really wanted to share this story because you asked me to do this based on the last poll about why patients have become NPCs and sheeple and also how doctors mirror that same feeling. So this starts with the history of medicine back in Greece in ancient China and India, where medicine wasn't like a pill-pushing mill. It was viewed always across every culture in the world practically as a harmony and balance between the internal body and external nature, ocean, fresh air, etc., your food and your connection with others. And even in the United States, what we call mankind's greatest hospital, MGH, was built right on the sea because of the belief at the time that, especially for those with pulmonary ailments, 
being close to seawater or sea air from the ocean was healing. This Massachusetts General Hospital, it's one of the Harvard teaching hospitals, they built it next to the sea for that reason, because even back then, it was recognized how important that connection with nature was. Very quickly, once it was recognized that we could isolate substances from the natural world into medications that could be easily packaged, and by the way, it is morphine and pain medications like cocaine turning into lidocaine, these are the first medications that we formed by isolating them from plants because as we know, medicine is all about treating pain, whether it's physical or emotional pain. That's what patients come to the doctor for. So it was morphine was isolated from opium, uh, lidocaine and other local anesthetics, ultimately from cocaine. And ether for anesthesia to allow surgery to happen. Uh, if we go many, many years later, using technology for virtual visits, telemedicine, this fundamentally transformed the basis of medicine being harmonious and balanced into how can we reduce medicine into something that is more bite-sized, more convenient. This allowed and justified insurance companies to be able to manage all these new medications and new types of surgeries that were made possible by anesthesia, right? Because without anesthesia, discovery of ether being used for anesthesia in the mid 1800s, you could never have surgery. So about 150 years ago, medicine explodes, insurance companies now have a justification for existence, and then human beings, patients and doctors alike became prey to convenience. Convenience, I live, I'm in an operating room. I almost said I live in an operating room because I spend so much time in one, but you'll appreciate that we have made the reductionist view of medicine into such a precise science here in an operating room. Just look at all of the incredible medications that we've isolated from plants, whether it's the atropine you see here, straight from belladonna, highly purified, life-saving medication, whether it is all of the opioid-based medications, whether it's the ephedrine, these all came from plants originally and yet packaged them for convenience and safety into easily deliverable little, literally, <laughs> IV vials that is life-saving but also takes away the connection that it once had with nature. So it became easier to have surgery maybe instead of preventing disease in the first place or going straight to pills instead of plants, or having virtual visits instead of in-person visits. We lose that connection, we lose that empathy when we're not physically with a patient and we're relying on a camera, right? So this is fundamentally against how human beings work. Human beings have a hard side, which is scientific, and if you want to call it right-brained, that, that's fine, right? It's like the ventilator here behind me. This is all hard science, you know, <laughs> anesthetics, and all these numbers for delivering gas, life support monitors, etc. This is the hard part, which is life-saving and important. But there's also a soft side. When you're on the operating room table that you just saw a moment ago, connecting bridging ourselves out of loneliness. Human beings cannot, absolutely cannot function if they're only living in the hard side and not in the soft side. And I'm not trying to say everyone's a special snowflake, absolutely not. But we need to recognize that there has to be a balance of hard and soft. And this has been completely thrown out the door through the reductionist view of medicine that you've seen the history of. Now, this has led to impersonal, it's led to mindless, disengaged interactions between patients and doctors. And if, you, if this resonates with you, please let me know, because I know many of you are commenting on this. And I absolutely, <laughs> I absolutely know that you have, because I've seen so many of my patients have felt that despite being mindlessly treated and disengaged, there is still stress. You think you can check out and feel relaxed because you're not engaged? It's being disengaged yet stressed at the same time that has led to the moral injury, that has led to the burnout that so many doctors and so many patients have experienced. It's like the worst experience going to a doctor's office. Nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to go because it sucks. You have to wait in line. You might be treated like 
You're just another sheeple coming in the door and you don't have autonomy over what happens is how many feel. It's this loss of authenticity, this loss of being able to feel your gut instincts that leads people to feel like NPCs or sheeple. And this is, if nothing else sticks with you, this is the most important part because when we feel like we are non-playable characters, like we're just sheeple, we lose confidence. It erodes our self-esteem and our courage to advocate for ourselves. And the less we can speak up for ourselves, the more of an NPC or sheeple we will become. The more we lose our confidence, the more sheeple we become, both as doctors who have lost autonomy in the practice of medicine, or as patients who have lost the autonomy in their own health, what is most sacred to themselves. Whether you're in an operating room here or you're in the doctor's office or at home. So let me be very clear that in medical school, and I loved my medical school, but we were not taught how this connection between the mind and body, between patient and physician, will determine the course of how patients recover, whether from surgery, from a cold, from depression, from the loss of a loved one. Because the emphasis has been on the reductionist view. You're literally taking the harmony of nature and the individual or humans in their societies at large and you're funneling it down into a vial of fentanyl or you're into a pill or into a telemedicine button click visit. Now there's a time and a place for all of these, but I want to repeat this cycle of what happened. We reduced medicine down into vials and pills and button clicks. We lost touch of the hard and soft sides being balanced. We became human doing instead of human being. We became disengaged and stressed all at the same time. And that led to moral injury, burnout, losing our gut instincts and ultimately feeling, feeling like NPCs that no longer have the courage or the confidence to speak up for ourselves. So it's not all doom and gloom. How can we break this cycle? How can you regain confidence? I'm gonna share with you a couple of my tips. Number one, we need to retake responsibility for our health. We are often victims, but society and the healthcare system at large has funneled us into a victim role and feeling victimized. So while we cannot control being the victim of a car accident, of cancer, of autoimmune disease, of depression sometimes, we can and should take responsibility for our bodies being something that we need to ultimately heal and be responsible and take agency in the process of healing. So when we take responsibility, it helps us gain and regain that confidence and that empowerment to advocate for ourselves. If we are leaving our bodies to be healed by big pharma, if we're leaving our bodies to be healed by a doctor whom we've never had a meaningful conversation with, or a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, or if you're walking into this operating room here and you're just like, ah, whatever. You know, my video on loneliness and the elderly gentleman whose story I shared with you, he was like, ah, I'm having a hip replacement. I don't know why. That level of disengagement affects our mind and physical bodies in very, very deep ways. The scars are visible under anesthesia, which is why I share this here in the operating room. It's not fluffy duffy, it's very practical, tangible effects. And when we gain confidence, we can remove ourselves from victimization and be able to say things, and if you wanna write notes, go ahead. We can say things like, doctor, I value your opinion, and I also believe I should be an active participant in my health. Can you please clarify that plan so I can better understand it? Or we can feel more confident to say something like, doctor, I don't understand what you're saying. You know how many patients, they are super sweet, super kind, but they're like not at all with it because maybe they're stressed out before surgery when they're seeing me. Maybe they're so depressed when they come to me for ketamine in my infusion clinic that they, they have this whole important history and they can't 
pick at it because they're so depressed that their memory is not there. I'm not saying they're dumb, absolutely not. But for any number of reasons, patients might feel disempowered and they might not understand the doctor's plan. Yet they're not confident enough to say, doctor, I'm confused. Can you please explain that? Can you please put it in layman's terms? Doctor, I want to be the best patient because I'm responsible for myself and I want to better understand what your plan is so I can help you ultimately give me the best healing possible. Patients are often way too unconfident or <laughs> they lack the courage to say that to me. And I think I'm a pretty sociable, engageable person. Yet there's a power play dynamic and I get that. And I also get that patients have been groomed for so many years through this model of reducing our emotions to pills and to just showing up to a doctor's office and relinquishing our responsibility. <sighs> How about having the courage to tell your doctor, your plan sounds vague to me, doctor. Can you please more clearly explain what you think is going on in my body? Because I know my body and I know my pain. I know my bleeding. I know my mood. I know my reflux, whatever it is, is not normal for me. You know your body better than anyone else. You might not know what is causing it, but you need to be confident in expressing what you're feeling so that you can win by your doctor also understanding because your doctor wins when you win. You succeed together or you fail together. But if you're not confident, if you're not responsible, your doctor cannot be responsible for you. This is how we can heal the scars of trauma, come out of the cycles of depression, anxiety that we're stuck in, so many of us. How we can re-engage with ourselves to ultimately be more authentic and trust our gut instincts to advocate for ourselves. So what did that patient tell me when I called them the next day? I called them up first, it's like, who are you again? I'm like, well, I'm Dr. Kaveh, I was your anesthesiologist. Oh, I'm so sorry, doctor. Everyone thinks I'm a telemarketer, right? So unfortunately, like these phone scams are horrible. But once we got past that, I said, you know, ma'am, there was a lot of sorrow and pain right before you fell asleep. Do you remember that? No. So unfortunately, no recollection of it, but I said, you know, what happened before you came into the operating room? Many patients feel like they're just in a meat packing factory, like they're a cog in a wheel, like they're another button click to their doctor. They feel rushed, they feel it's impersonal, and they feel vulnerable without having any empathy from those that are ultimately responsible and in charge of their life during something as sacred as surgery. She was like, Doctor, how did you know that? This is not anything special about me. This is just years and years and decades of observing what's been going on. So I'm not saying I have omniscience or anything, but I'm saying that that, that resonated with her. And she said, Doctor, I think I started crying because after I hit age 45, I felt invisible. People didn't notice me. I got depressed. I think that's why I gained so much weight. And no one has ever asked why I feel depressed and why I can't lose weight. She said, no doctors ever asked her. And I asked, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Did you ever mention it to anyone? And what do you think the answer was? Did she have the courage to share something so deep and personal and really be so vulnerable to someone after she felt invisible and felt ignored after all those years? Feeling shame? No, she had never spoken up either. I'm not saying she's right or wrong. I'm not saying the doctors are right or wrong, but I'm saying that if patients are not courageous enough to speak up and doctors aren't trained, don't have the time from insurance companies putting pressures on them, hospital policies putting pressure on them, being forced to follow protocols. Both are cogs in a wheel. Both have lost autonomy. Both have lost compassion for themselves and each other. 
Who's the sheeple here? Is it the patient? Is it the doctor? Or is it both? I hope that you recognize there are ways that we can both come out of this and both reconnect with our authentic selves to ultimately advocate and recognize that we have more power over our health than we've ever been told.